As we continue in the gospel story, we're moving into the New Testament, and we're going to be looking at the book of John chapter 1 in a moment. So if you want to get your devices open to that or your Bible that you have with you to John chapter 1. And as we move into that, I want, you, I want us to think about something. I want us to think about the idea that you and I have a beginning. We have an origin. At conception, you were formed in the womb by God's hand. And then you have a birth date. You have a day and a time that you were brought into and introduced into this world outside of your mommy's tummy. Just, I mean, there was a day, there was a time, you could set it down, you could write it down. I'm not minimizing at all labor or any of that. I'm just... As we look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in the Gospel accounts, we see that Jesus had the same experience that every other human on this planet Earth experience, and that is that he was born as a baby. Isn't it remarkable to think that the creator of this universe, the savior of the world, came in human form, a baby, born to us in a manger. Heaven came down. Heaven came down. The birth of Jesus is actually a pivotal point in the history of the earth. And we read about the accounts of Jesus' birth, and if you're looking it up, you'll find it in Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 2. At Christmas time, that's where we go for our Advent readings. Because both of those Gospels share the account of Jesus being born. Now we learn some things. You probably already know all these. But we learn that Jesus was born of the virgin named Mary. He had no earthly biological father. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she carried the baby Jesus in her womb for nine months. This biological miracle, this act of God, is one of many factors that set Jesus apart from the rest of humanity. We also learn some other things in these Gospels account revolving around Jesus' birth, that Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph at the time. And that they traveled to Bethlehem for a census. And then while they were there, Mary went into labor, but they couldn't find a place for them to stay. So they ended up in a stable, a barn of sorts. And Jesus was born. And we read that he was laid in a manger and that Mary swaddled him with some cloths. Here's the deal. Jesus wasn't just a regular baby laying in a manger that night. When Mary and Joseph... And eventually the shepherds, when they looked down at the manger to look at baby Jesus, it was the first time that humanity looked down and saw heaven. John, the gospel writer, writes this in, in John 1, verse 14. He says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen? Now, I know that Justin and Kyle are starting to cook burgers behind me, okay? And we can start smelling it sizzling on the grill, can't we? Now, however, I hope that our amens are right here and not back there, okay? <laughs> but if anything, you're staying awake with me. Thanks, guys. This is awesome. I've never had people cook behind me. Save me one, would you? When we celebrate in the Christmas season, we aren't just celebrating a baby that was born. We're not just celebrating the birth of Jesus or my daughter's birthday, December 25th. It's not just that. The significance is this, that born to us that day, Jesus was God in the flesh. Say that with me. God in the flesh. God was among us that day. God Himself with us through the person of Jesus Christ. The glory of God. The holiness of God. The completeness, the fullness of God in the same space as sinners and outcasts. The theological word for this is incarnation. Now, you have been, it may have been introduced to this word through... Jack Black featured in Nacho Libre. 
where he sings in Spanish. In Spanish. Encarnacio. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Encarnacion is the Spanish word for incarnation. So if you've heard it there, it's a little different than the context that we are. It's a whole lot of different than the context we are talking about right now. But the word is incarnation, and it's a Latin word that literally means the word became flesh. God took on the fullness of the human nature. The fullness of the human nature, emotionally, physically, mentally, he was fully human. He was fully man. He grew up. He grew tired. His mom probably got tired of him growing up because she kept having to find new sandals. Like, you know, it only takes six months and he grows out of these things. He ate. He drank. He slept. He walked. He laughed. He cried. He felt lonely. He felt happy. He sweat. He bled. He gave high fives. He gave hugs. But the purpose of the incarnation of Jesus was not just to taste food and feel sorrow or happiness. The purpose of the incarnation was the Son of God came in the flesh in order to be the Savior of mankind. Amen. He came in the flesh to be our personal Savior. And it was necessary for the Savior of the world to take on human form. The skin that you have on your arms. It was, it was necessary. Because without it, without the incarnation of Jesus, we would not be able to to receive freedom. Why? Because if he were not in the flesh, he would not be able to die on a cross. He would have not been able to have a last breath. His, his heart would have not been able to stop beating if he were not fully human. But because he was fully human, he was able to shed blood on a cross and die on the cross to forgive sins. And then that's good news for us. See, sin requires bloodshed for forgiveness. And God says, I will provide a substitute for you. I will come in human form and I will stand in the gap so that you do not have to be on that cross. Rather, I will die in your place for you and for me. That's pretty cool. That's amazingly cool. The incarnation, by the way, is not a metamorphosis. You guys know what a metamorphosis is, right? It's when a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. The incarnation is not a metamorphosis. You see, God did not change who he is to become something different so that the divine was no longer there. He was fully man and fully God at the same time. He did not change. He simply took on human form because just as much as he is fully man he's also fully God and it's not a 50-50 it's a hundred hundred he's a hundred percent man as we talked about and he's a hundred percent God the fullness of God is found in the incarnation this is what we call the divine nature of Christ or the divinity of Christ now let's talk about the four gospels that we're entering into here in the gospel story as we transition through the bible or I'm sorry read through the bible of the four Gospels, the first three are called the Synoptic Gospels. You guys didn't know you were getting some heavy theology this morning, did you? You were like, whoa, bro, I, just, I see a dunk tank. What are you doing to me here, you know? But this is important, good stuff, okay? Amen? You guys with me here? Of the four Gospels, three are called the Synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, they all focus on the earthly perspective of the life and ministry of Jesus. Super important. Very vital. But the gospel writer John, he goes a little deeper. He focuses on the divine nature of the incarnation. He looks at the Godhead of Jesus Christ. He pauses and looks at the fact that this is God in human form, and this is why, and this is who. He talks about Jesus' claims of being the Son of God. Now, it'd be like this. Let me describe it to you this way. The first three Gospels, okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If Matthew, Mark, and Luke were going to describe this brand new vehicle to you, they'd say, hey, come on over, friend. Check out this new car. 
Look, it's got four doors and open and close, open and close. Look at the trunk, open and close. This is great, isn't it? Look at the sleek design. Woo, why don't you step inside? Let's sit down in here. Woo, look at this double stitch leather interior. Wow, this is impressive, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is great. And they would show you, look at the touch screen navigation. You push that and it'll get you there. Isn't that great? That's awesome. Wow. Now listen to this. Long, long, Ooh, now we're getting really, yeah, that's pretty cool. Now check this out. Uh-huh, zero to 60. 4.3 seconds, Ooh, bah, bah. you know, you're like, wow, that was cool. Thank you, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, if John were going to introduce the same vehicle to you, he'd go, uh, would you come outside of the car, please? He'd pop that hood, open that hood up, and he'd go, check this out. You want to know why that thing can go from 0 to 60 and 4 point whatever? Right here, over 200 horsepower <laughs> under the hood. You want to know how the navigation system, can you get you here to Starbucks the quickest way? This is the software that's installed that connects to that satellite up there to tell you where to go. That's how. You see, John focuses in on the divine nature and who he is as fully God to accomplish what he did on this planet and on the cross and out of the grave. Now, each gospel traces the origin. They smell the hamburgers. That's great. <laughs> They're all coming. Yeah, this works. If the preacher won't, the hamburgers will. I'm kidding. Each gospel traces the origin of Jesus. I want to give you what I'm talking about here. Okay, if you're going to look at each gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you're going to find the origins, the beginnings that they give you. Matthew is going to start with the lineage. We looked at that last week. And he's going to go all the way back to Father Abraham. And he's going to fast forward and then get to Jesus' birth. He's going to give you some beginning points. The gospel of Mark, he starts in his fast action paced gospel, he's going to start at John the Baptist. He doesn't even start at his birth. He goes right to the anointing that we see there at the baptism. Now Luke, he does start with lineage, but he goes halfway. He doesn't go all the way back. Matthew starts at David, and then he goes to the birth of Jesus and unpacks that. But John, John, our buddy John, he goes way back. Because here's the deal. Jesus' beginnings is not on earth. Which is where we're leaning to when we're talking about the divinity of Jesus. This is super important. John goes way back. He pulls back the curtain of time to where time was not time back then. I'm not sure what that means. but In John 1, 1 through 3, it says this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. Amen? The Word was God. Amen? He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word existed way before anything else ever existed. Now, who is the Word? What is the Word? Well, just to make sure that we're clear on what John's talking about, which is what we read a little earlier ago in verse 14, he says, So the Word became human flesh and made His home among us. He, the Word, Jesus, was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. See, Jesus goes way back. And it says that it wasn't just Abraham. He goes way back to before the earth was created, Jesus was there. See, He's telling us, guys, Jesus is not just a human. He is the divine nature of God, the fullness of God. If you want to know who God is, you look at who Jesus is. Jesus always has been. His birth on earth was his humble entrance to show us who God is. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. Jesus will always be God. Jesus existed in the beginning, and with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, they created this world. And nothing was created that wasn't through him. See, John goes back, doesn't he? Now, communication experts say that when you're preparing a talk, a speech, when you are getting ready to preach a sermon, you want to ask three important questions. So if you're going into communication, these are three questions that you want to keep with you the rest of your public speaking life. Question number one is, what do I want them to know? 
What do I want my hearers to know? And question number two is, why do I want them to know it? And question number three is, what do I want them to do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked those three questions because I'm just going to simplify it for us. Number one, why do I want you to know about the incarnation? I'm sorry, what do I want you to know? I got, I got my questions backed up, sorry. What do I want you to know? I want you to know that Jesus was fully man and fully God. It's called the incarnation and the div divinity, the divine nature of Jesus. That's what I want you to know. I want you to hear the words of John in the last chapter of his book where he says, but these are written so that you might continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. I, that's what I want you to know. I want you to understand that we are taking our time to get a little theological on this Family Fun Festival Day because it is highly important for us to understand that the greatest view of God is seen in the person of Jesus. That's what I want you to know. He's the only Son of God. And I'm going to get un, not very grammatically correct. There ain't nobody like him. There ain't nobody going to replace him. And there ain't nobody who can do what he did. He dropped the mic. He came out of that grave. And there is nobody that replaces our Lord Jesus. Amen? Now, why do I want you to know this? Question number two. Why? John spells it out perfectly for us. So I'm going to use his words. In that same last chapter, chapter 20, he says, And that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That's why. That by believing in Him, you will have life. Why should we believe in the incarnation of the divinity of Christ? Because when we believe who He is, we receive the life that He came to give us. Now, what do I want you to do about it? What do I want you to do about it? You ready for this? Believe it. That's what I want you to do. I'm not here to convince you, by, by the way. I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to study scripture. If you are a skeptic, I want you to begin a journey to figure out, is Jesus really God? Is he really God in the flesh? Is he really fully God? Were all things made through him and by him? I challenge you to go on a quest to find the truth for yourself because I know when Jesus said that if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. And it's true. You'll find the truth if you seek it. What do I want you to do about it? I want you to believe it in your heart. I want you to confess it with your lips. I want you to live it with your life. And I want you to live for it with every second you have. Give yourself fully to God just as He gave Himself fully to you on the cross. So can I encourage you today to get to know your Savior Jesus? To understand who He is in the flesh and discover who He is as fully God? Read about Him. Talk about Him. Think about Him. Share Him to others. Worship Him. Honor Him. Give Him all the glory that He deserves. And live your life fully for Him because He gave His life fully for you. Yes. Amen. Would you believe in Him in a way that changes the course of your life? Because it's possible. Jesus is the fullness of God. Now, this is crucial for our faith. It's crucial for our faith in Jesus because if he is only a man, and that's all he is, then he has no divine power to forgive you of your sins. He has no divine power to heal you of the things in your life that you need healing from in his name. But Jesus was the Word, became flesh. Amen? He was the Word before He became the flesh. He was the Word after He was the flesh. He was always the Word because He was God among us. I love the fact that Jesus was held in the arms of a woman that He created. Think about that. Which is why, when I know it's not Christmas time, my favorite song, Mary, did you know your baby boy Someday walk on water. Oh, I love it. Jesus came down to earth in the flesh for you, for me. He emptied himself. He gave up the rights in heaven as God to identify with us 
so that he can heal us, so that he can help us, because we need a rescue. I think one of the most powerful illustration stories of the incarnation I heard this week I want to share with you. There's a wealthy, powerful king. And this wealthy, powerful king is going along the roadside. And he sees a beautiful peasant girl working in the field for her father. He's immediately smitten with love for this gal. He wants to marry her, but because of her lowly estate and his high office, this is a very tricky negotiation. The king could send his soldiers, remove her from her work in the field, and bring her to her side, but he knew that you can't compel true love. Or he could send his servants and his soldiers and shower her with gifts and sweep her off her feet, but he also knew that you can't buy true love. So instead, he takes off his royal robe, he puts on a peasant garb, a coat. He takes off his crown with jewels and replaces it with an ordinary cap. The king then goes out to the field and starts working beside her and strikes up a conversation. How are you doing? <laughs> this conversation strikes up a relationship. Well, how are you doing? The relationship becomes love and the love becomes so deep that she now would give her life to be with him every day she had. And it would not matter to her that he was only a peasant working in a field. And it's only then that he is free to reveal to her his true identity as a king. Isn't that what God did for us? God took off his glorious robe in heaven and he put on human flesh. He removed his crown of glory and replaced it with the crown of thorns in its place. He did all this to prove his love, his extravagant love for you and for me and the entire world. What a beautiful mystery of the incarnation of Jesus. So that you and I could approach God in his glory and he stood in the gap so that we can come boldly to God when we need grace and mercy the most and say, God, I need you. Jesus did that for us. Now that's a reason to get up in the morning. That's a reason to run the race until our last breath on earth. That's a reason to hold on until we get to eternity <laughs> someday because we've given our life to Jesus Christ and he forgives us, cleanses us, and heals us and we move towards him every day. That's a reason to do that every day. My question is, what are you going to do with this message? What are you going to do with the information of the incarnation? Are you going to just disregard it and say, well, that was nice? Or are you going to say, you know what, I choose to believe that Jesus is fully man, fully God, and because of that, he can fully forgive me of my sins. And because of that, he can fully redeem my soul. He can fully cleanse me from all unrighteousness. See, the enemy would have to tell you, well, he's just a good teacher, he's a good guy, just live a good life, and you know, well, you got stuff, but just let that be. No, Jesus died on the cross so that we could become his holy people. We should not stop anything less than that, amen? So what are you going to do? Will you believe? Or will you disregard it and hope that things just turn out good? All right. My encouragement to every one of us is if we do believe this already, that we will pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ that will allow us to see the fullness of God. Not just a Sunday sermon, and that's good, thank you, I've had enough for six more days, but an everyday relationship with Him because He gave Himself fully to us. If you don't know Him, my encouragement is to make a decision today not guaranteed tomorrow. Make a decision today to say, I believe that Jesus came. That he was fully God. He died on the cross so that I can be forgiven. So my neighbors can be forgiven. So that we can all go to heaven and live the life that he's designed for us here and there. That's what I hope happens with this message. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?
Now, there may be somebody here who has never given their life to Jesus Christ. It could be a teenager, a young person. It could be somebody later in life. It could be a visitor, somebody here that's been here for a long time, but you've never made a decision to say, Jesus, I believe in what you've done. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. And I know you have a plan for me. And so I confess to you today that you are my Lord and Savior. I wonder if there's somebody here that wants to make that decision to follow after him. And if that's you, I want to be able to pray for you. Simply just lift up your hand and say, Pastor Rex, that's me. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today. And I'll pray with, pray with you this morning. Some of you maybe have, you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you recognize, wow, Jesus did give everything. And there's areas of my life that I'm holding back. And you this morning want to recognize those areas and say, God, I give you that area right there. Lord, bring healing in that area right there. Father, I would desire more. And you're calling me to that. And that, that's you this morning. Just lift up your hand and say, that's my prayer this morning, Pastor Rex. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. There may be some of our friends that are watching online today. And I'm speaking specifically to you. You may want to make a decision to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's simply this. It's double A, B, C. A, acknowledge that God has a plan for you. A, admit that your sin is in the way. B, believe that what Jesus did on the cross and out of the grave forgives you of your sins today. And C, confess Him as Lord and Savior with your mouth. If that's you, we want to pray for you. And then we'll pray for, for all those who raise their hand to give their life fully to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. I acknowledge that you have a wonderful plan for me. But I admit that my sin is in the way of that plan. Jesus, I believe that you can forgive me right now. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose again. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Savior of this world. I confess that you are my Lord today. And I desire to follow you every day. In your name, Jesus. And Lord, right now, would you be with those that raise their hand to say, I have areas of my life that I want to give full control to the Lord. God, right now, you see them, you hear them. Lord, I know that you are working in their lives. And I thank you for that, Father. Lord, I thank you for this great time that we're gathered together. Lord, I pray for our neighbors that might be hearing these words. Lord, may they hear that we love them. We want them to know you as Lord and Savior so that we can see them in heaven someday, but also live a life side by side that honors you here on this earth. Father, thank you for the food that we're going to eat today. Thank you for the fun that we're going to have. Father, may you still stay right in the middle of our conversations around the table. May you still stay right in the middle of our fun. May we be encouraging and uplifting to each other so that the world will know that you are Messiah. Thank you, Father. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.